Chapter 8, The Potions Master. There, look. Where? Next to the tall kid with red hair. Wearing the glasses? Did you see his face? Did you see his scar? Whispers followed Harry from the moment he left his dormitory next day. People queuing outside of classrooms stood on tiptoe to get a look at him, or doubled back to pass him in the corridors again, staring. Harry wished they wouldn't, because he was trying to concentrate on finding his way to classes. There were 142 staircases at Hogwarts. Wide, sweeping ones, narrow, rickety ones, some that led somewhere different on a Friday, some with a vanishing step halfway up that you had to remember to jump. Then there were doors that wouldn't open unless you asked politely or tickled them exactly uh, in the right spot. And doors that weren't really doors at all, but solid walls just pretending. It was also very hard to remember where anything was because it all seemed to move around a lot. The people in the portraits kept going to visit each other and Harry was sure the coats of armor could walk. The ghosts didn't help either. It was always a nasty shock when one of them glided suddenly through a door you were trying to open. Nearly Headless Nick was always happy to point new Gryffindors in the right direction, but Peeves, the poltergeist, was worth two locked doors and a trick staircase if you met him when you were late for class. He would drop waste paper baskets on your head, pull rugs from under your feet, pelt you with bits of chalk, or sneak up behind you, invisible, grab your nose and screech, gotcha conk! Even worse than Peeves, if that was possible, was the caretaker, Argus Filch. A caretaker would be your custodial staff. Harry and Ron managed to get on the wrong side of him on their very first morning. Filch found them trying to force their way through a door, which unluckily turned out to be the entrance to the out-of-bounds corridor on the third floor. He wouldn't believe that they were lost, was sure they were trying to break into it on purpose, and was threatening to lock them in the dungeons when they were rescued by Professor Quirrell, who was passing. Filch owned a cat called Mrs. Norris, a scrawny, dust-colored creature with bulging lamp-like eyes, just like Filch's. She patrolled the corridors alone. Break a rule in front of her, put just one toe out of line, and she'd whisk off for Filch. She'd run off to get Filch, who'd appear, wheezing two seconds later. Filch knew the secret passageways of the school better than anyone, except perhaps the Weasley twins, and could pop up as suddenly as any of the ghosts. The students all hated him, and it was the dearest ambition of many to give Mrs. Norris a good kick. And then, once you had managed to find them, there were the lessons themselves. There was a lot more to magic, as Harry quickly found out, than waving your wand and saying a few funny words. They had to study the night skies through their telescopes every Wednesday at midnight and learn the names of different stars and the movements of the planets. Three times a week, they went out to the greenhouses, so that's where they grow plants, uh, behind the castle to study herbology with a dumpy little witch called Professor Sprout, where they learned how to take care of all the strange plants and fungi and found out what they were used for. Easily, the most boring lesson was History of Magic, which was the only class taught by a ghost. Professor Binns had been very old indeed when he had fallen asleep in front of the staff room fire and got up the next morning to teach, leaving his body behind him. Binns droned on and on while they scribbled down names and dates and got Emmerich the Evil and Uric the Oddball mixed up. Professor Flitwick, the charms teacher, was a tiny little wizard who had to stand on a pile of books to see over his desk. At the start of their very first lesson, he took the register, so he did attendance, and when he reached Harry's name, he gave an excited squeak and toppled out of sight. He fell out of sight. Professor McGonagall was again different. She had been quite right, Harry had been quite right to think she wasn't a teacher to cross. Strict and clever, she gave them a talking to the moment they had sat down in her first class. Transfiguration is some of the most complex and dangerous magic you will learn at Hogwarts, she said. Anyone messing around in my class will leave and not come back. You have been warned. Then she changed her desk into a pig and back again. 
They were all very impressed and couldn't wait to get started, but soon realized they were going to be changing the furniture. They weren't going to be changing the furniture into animals for a long time. After making a lot of complicated notes, they were each given a match and started to, trying to turn it into a needle. By the end of the lesson, only Hermione Granger had made any difference to her match. Professor McGonagall showed the class how it had all gone, how it had gone all silvery and pointy, and gave Hermione a rare smile. The class everyone had really been looking forward to was defense against the dark arts, but but Quirrell's lessons turned out to be a bit of a joke. His classroom smelled strongly of garlic, which everyone said was to ward off a vampire he'd met in Romania and was afraid would be coming back to get him one of these days. His turban, he told them, had been given to him by an African prince as a thank you for getting rid of a troublesome zombie, but they weren't sure they believed this story. For one thing, when Seamus Finnegan asked eagerly to hear how Quirrell had fought off the zombie, Quirrell went pink and started talking about the weather. For another, they had noticed that a funny smell hung around the turban, and the Weasley twins insisted that it was stuffed full of garlic as well, so that Quirrell was protected wherever he went. Harry was relieved to find out that he wasn't miles behind everyone else. Lots of people had come from Muggle families and, like him, hadn't had any idea that they were witches and wizards. There was so much to learn that even people like Ron didn't have much of a head start. So this chapter, when we begin, uh, it gives a lot of information about the different teachers and the different lessons. And that's really because uh, the book series is seven books long. And so there's one book for each year Harry is in Hogwarts. So J.K. Rowling is using this time to set the groundwork for not just this book, but future books. So she's introducing the different lessons they'll have to take, and she's introducing the teachers that uh, will teach them. So we have lessons like astronomy, where they have to go up to the tall tower and use a telescope to look into the night sky and study planets. Uh, you have charms, which is taught by a little tiny wizard, Professor Flitwick. I don't actually think he's this small. Um, I think he's like three feet tall. Uh, and so he's a funny little wizard and charms is more of the magic magic. Uh, you're introduced to Professor Binns, who apparently is a very, very boring teacher. Uh, he is so boring that he didn't realize he died. And so when he got up to teach his class, he left his body behind him and was just a ghost and didn't think anything of it. Uh, and then we're also introduced to Professor McGonagall, who is a very strict teacher. So she has high expectations and she doesn't tolerate fooling around. And then we're introduced to Professor Quirrell, who seems to be a bit of a joke. Uh, and so J.K. Rowling has spent that time to introduce us to these different teachers, uh, probably so that she doesn't have to use time later on to reintroduce these teachers. And so she's using that space in this chapter to say, I'm going to use this now. I'm going to make that investment. So then I can just refer back to that information later on. And so Harry said in this last uh, paragraph that he was happy to find out that he's not actually that far behind people. Uh, and so when he was starting Hogwarts. Remember, he was super concerned that he wouldn't know any magic, but it turns out he's on the same page as just about everybody else. Friday was an important day for Harry and Ron. They finally managed to find their way down to the Great Hall for breakfast with getting, without getting lost once. What have we got today? Harry asked Ron as he poured sugar on his porridge. Double potions with the Slytherins, said Ron. Snape's head of Slytherin House. They say he always favors them. We'll be able to see if it's true. Wish McGonagall favored us, said Harry. Professor McGonagall was head of Gryffindor House, but it hadn't stopped her giving them a huge pile of homework the day before. Uh, so there's the four houses in Hogwarts, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, Slytherin, and Gryffindor. And each of the houses has a different teacher who is their head of house. And so we've just found out that Slytherin House, uh, Professor Snape, who we're going to meet very shortly, is the head of that house. And Professor McGonagall, who we've already met, is the head of Gryffindor House. And so apparently she doesn't favor uh, the Gryffindors like uh, Snape favors the Slytherins. Just then the post arrived. Harry had got used to this by now, but had given him a bit of a shock on the first morning when about a hundred owls had suddenly streamed into the Great Hall during breakfast, 
circling the tables until they saw their owners and dropping letters and packages on their laps. Hedwig hadn't brought Harry anything so far. She sometimes flew in to nibble his ear and have a bit of toast before going off to sleep in the owlery with the other school owls. This morning, however, she fluttered down between the marmalade, which is jam, and the sugar bowl and dropped a note onto Harry's plate. Harry tore it open at once. Dear Harry, it said in an untidy scrawl, so the writing is not neat. Uh, kind of like Hamza's writing. Hamza's writing is not super neat. Uh, I know you get Friday afternoons off, so would you like to come and have a cup of tea with me around three? I want to hear all about your first week. Send us an answer back with Hedwig. Hagrid. Harry borrowed Ron's quill, scribbled, yes, please, see you later, on the back of the note, and sent Hedwig off again. It was lucky that Harry had tea with Hagrid to look forward to, because the potions lesson turned out to be the worst thing that had happened to him so far. At the start of term banquet, Harry had got the idea that Professor Snape disliked him. By the end of the first potions lesson, he knew he'd been wrong. Snape didn't like Harry, or Snape didn't dislike Harry. He hated him. Potions lessons took place down in one of the dungeons. It was colder here than up in the main castle, and would have been quite creepy enough without the pickled animals floating in glass jars all around the walls. Snape, like Flitwick, started the class by taking the register, so again, taking the attendance, and like Flitwick, he paused at Harry's name. Ah, yes, he said softly. Harry Potter, our new celebrity. Draco Malfoy and his friends Crabbe and Goyle sniggered behind their hands. They laughed. They <laughs> Snape finished calling the names and looked up at the class. His eyes were black like Hagrid's, but they had none of Hagrid's warmth. They were cold and empty and made you think of dark tunnels. You are here to learn the subtle science and exact art of potion making, he began. He spoke in barely more than a whisper, but they caught every word. Like Professor McGonagall, Snape had the gift of keeping a class silent without effort. As there is little foolish wand waving here, many of you will hardly believe this is magic. I don't expect you will really understand the beauty of the softly simmering cauldron with its shimmering fumes the delicate power of liquids that creep through human veins, bewitching the mind, ensnaring the senses. I can teach you how to bottle fame, brew glory, even stopper death, if you aren't as big a bunch of dunderheads as I usually have to teach. More silence followed this little speech. Harry and Ron exchanged looks with raised eyebrows. Hermione Granger was on the edge of her seat and looked desperate to start proving that she wasn't a dunderhead. Potter, said Snape suddenly. What would I get if I added powder root of Ashfodel to an infusion of wormwood? Powdered root of what to an infusion of what? Harry glanced at Ron, who looked as stumped as he was. Hermione's hand had shot into the air. I don't know, sir, said Harry. Snape's lips curled into a sneer. Toot toot, fame clearly isn't everything. He ignored Hermione's hand. Let's try again. Potter, where would you look if I told you to find me a bazaar? Hermione stretched her hand as high into the air as it would go without leaving her seat. But Harry didn't have the faintest idea what a bazaar was. He tried not to look at Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle, who were shaking with laughter. I don't know, sir. Thought you wouldn't open a book before coming, eh, Potter? Harry forced himself to keep looking straight into those cold eyes. He had looked through his books at the Dursleys, but did Snape expect him to remember everything in 1,000 magical herbs and fungi? Snape was still ignoring Hermione's quivering hand. What is the difference, Potter, between monkshood and wolfsbane? At this, Hermione stood up, her hand stretching towards the dungeon stealing, ceiling. I don't know, said Harry quietly. I think Hermione does, though. Why don't you try her? A few people laughed. Harry caught Seamus's eye, and Seamus winked. Snape, however, was not pleased. Sit down, he snapped at Hermione. 
For your information, Potter, Ashwedell and Wormwood make a sleeping potion so powerful it is known as the Draught of Living Death. A bazaar is a stone taken from the stomach of a goat, and it will save you from most poisons. As for monkshood and wolfsbane, they are the same plant, which also goes by the name of aquanite. Well, why aren't you all copying that down? There was a sudden rummaging for quills and parchment. Over the noise, Snape said, and a point will be taken from Gryffindor House for your cheek, Potter. When someone says, like, for your cheek, it means for, like, your sassiness. Things didn't improve for the Gryffindors as the potion's lesson continued. Snape put them all into pairs and set them to mixing up a simple potion to cure boils. Uh, boils are on your skin, and they're bumps uh, that grow, and there's usually, like, pus or something in them. Uh, they're not super pleasant. He swept around in his long black cloak, watching them weigh dried nettles and crush snake fangs, criticizing almost everyone except Malfoy, who he seemed to like. He was just telling everyone to look at the perfect way Malfoy had stewed his horn slugs when clouds of acid green smoke and a loud hissing filled the dungeon. Neville had somehow managed to melt Seamus's cauldron into a twisted blob, and their potion was seeping across the stone floor, burning holes in people's shoes. Within seconds, the whole class was standing on their stools, while Neville, who had been drenched in the potion when the cauldron collapsed, moaned in pain as angry red boils sprang up all over his arms and legs. Idiot boy, snarled Snape, clearing the spilled potion away with one wave of his wand. I suppose you added the porcupine quills before taking the cauldron off the fire. Neville whimpered as boils started to pop all over his nose. Take him to the hospital wing, Snape spat at Seamus. Then he rounded on Harry and Ron, who had been working next to Neville. You, Potter, why didn't you tell him not to add the quills? Thought he'd make you look good if he got it wrong, did you? That's another point you've lost for Gryffindor. That was so unfair that Harry opened his mouth to argue, but Ron kicked him behind their cauldron. Don't push it, he muttered. I've heard Snape can turn very nasty. As they climbed the steps out of the dungeon an hour later, Harry's mind was racing and his spirits were low. He'd lost two points for Gryffindor in his very first week. Why did Snape hate him so much? Cheer up, said Ron. Snape's always taking points off Fred and George. Can I come and meet Hagrid with you? At five to three, they left the castle and made their way across the grounds. Hagrid lived in a small wooden house on the edge of the Forbidden Forest. A crossbow and a pair of galoshes were outside the front door. So Harry and Ron had their first uh, potions lesson. Apparently it did not go super well. Um, nobody really seems to understand the making of potions except apparently Malfoy. And according to Harry, Professor Snape really doesn't like him. Uh, and we don't know why. We don't even know if this is true. But we just know that Harry feels like Snape does not like him at all. Uh, and so now after class, uh, Harry has lost two points. So remember, uh, you can the students of Hogwarts, they can collect points up for doing good things but they can also lose points. And then at the end of the semester or the end of the year, the house with the most points they win, uh, Harry has lost two. So he's not off to a great start for his house. Uh, but so now he and Ron are off to go and see Hagrid. When Harry knocked, they heard a frantic scrambling from inside and several booming barks. Then Hagrid's voice rang out saying, back Fang, back. Hagrid's big hairy face appeared in a crack as he pulled the door open. Hang on, he said, back fang. He then let them in, struggling to keep a hold on the collar of an enormous black boarhound. Uh, a boarhound is a type of dog. If you Google it, you'll see that it's just a dog. There was only one room inside. Hams and pheasants, pheasants are a type of bird, uh, were hanging from the ceiling. A copper kettle was boiling on the fire, and in a corner stood a massive bed with a patchwork quilt over it. Make yourselves at home, said Hagrid letting go of Fang, who bounded straight at Ron and started licking his ears. Like Hagrid, Fang was clearly not as fierce as he looked. This is Ron, Harry told Hagrid, who was pouring boiling water into a large teapot and putting rock cakes onto a plate. Another Weasley, eh? said Hagrid, glancing at Ron's freckles. I spent half my life chasing your brothers away from the forest. The rock cakes almost broke their teeth. 
But Harry and Ron pretended to be enjoying them as they told Hagrid, Hagrid all about their first lessons. Uh, so I personally have never actually understood what is a rock cake. I've come to accept that it is a cake that is made out of rocks. Uh, and so Hagrid being a giant probably can actually eat them. Uh, whereas Harry and Ron being humans really can't. Uh, not that I would recommend, but imagine if you go outside, put some rocks together and make a cake and then take a great big bite of it. Probably not going to go over well. Fang rested his head on Harry's knee and drooled all over his robes. Harry and Ron were delighted to hear Hagrid call Filch that old git. And as for that cat, Mrs. Norris, I'd like to introduce her to Fang sometime. Do you know, every time I go up to the cat at school, she follows me everywhere. Can't get rid of her. Filch puts her up to it. Harry told Hagrid about Snape's lesson. Hagrid, like Ron, told Harry not to worry about it, that Snape liked hardly any of the students. But he seemed to really hate me. Rubbish, said Hagrid. Why should he? Yet Harry couldn't help thinking that Hagrid didn't quite meet in his eyes when he said that. How's your brother Charlie? Hagrid asked Ron. I liked him a lot. Great with animals. Harry wondered if Hagrid had changed the subject on purpose. While Ron told Hagrid all about Charlie's work with dragons, Harry picked up a piece of paper that was lying on the table under the tea cozy. It was a cutting from the Daily Prophet. Gringotts break in latest. Investigations continue into the break in at Gringotts on 31 July, widely believed to be the work of dark wizards or witches unknown. Gringotts goblins today insisted that nothing had been taken. The vault that was searched had in fact been emptied the same day. But we're not telling you what was in there, so keep your noses out of it if you know what's good for you, said a Gringotts spokes goblin this afternoon. Harry remembered telling Ron telling him on the train that someone had tried to rob Gringotts, but Ron hadn't mentioned the date. Hagrid, said Harry, that Gringotts break-in happened on my birthday. It might have been happening while we were there. There was no doubt about it. Hagrid definitely didn't meet Harry's eyes this time. He grunted and offered him another rock cake. Harry read the story again. The vault that was searched had in fact been emptied earlier the same day. Hagrid had emptied vault 713, and if you call it emptying it, taking out that grubby little package. Had that been what the thieves were looking for? As Harry and Ron walked back to the castle for dinner, their pockets weighed down with the rock cakes they'd been too polite to refuse. Harry thought that none of the lessons he had so far been given uh, had given him so much to think about as tea with Hagrid. Had Hagrid collected that package just in time? Where was it now? And did Hagrid know something about Snape that he didn't want to tell Harry? And that ends chapter eight. Uh, this is a really good chapter to show you kind of a trademark of J.K. Rowling and her writing um, in Harry Potter and Philosopher's Stone. Because remember, this book is written for children. The main character is an 11 year old. And if you were to read all seven books, you will find that the tone of the novels and their language and such, it changes very drastically because as Harry ages, so do the readers. So by the time we're in book seven, when Harry is 17, J.K. Rowling is writing for a young adult audience. So book one is really for 11, 12 year olds. And so she uses a strategy of putting at the end of most chapters, a little bit of foreshadowing. So she has here Harry, who is thinking about this break-in, and he's asking all these questions that will be answered. So this last paragraph where he says, uh, had Hagrid collected that package just in time, where was it now? And did Hagrid know something about Snape that he didn't want to tell Harry? Those three questions will be answered in the novel. And so J.K. Rowling is essentially telling the reader that these are questions we should be thinking about because she will continue to drop hints and clues along the way. Uh, one of the beautiful things about her writing is that even though this book is technically, fa technically fantasy, most people have actually said that the seven Harry Potter books are really mystery novels. Uh, and so we will find clues. We will see little pieces along the way. And then at the end, we will find out who actually did it. Uh, so hopefully this reading has helped you. Uh, and I hope you have an awesome week. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, as always, let me know. Bye, everyone.